gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Which brings us to May. Hell of a month, May, if you cast your mind back. Uh, the show of the year is comprised of folks making their own personal reflections on the year that was. And I would not blame this next guest if he walked onto the stage with a can of kerosene and just set fire to the whole place. <laughs> but he's too classy for that. Ladies and gentlemen, fresh from the front lines in Canberra, Bill Shorten. Good evening, everybody, and first of all, I'd like to thank the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. I pay my respects to both elders past, present and emerging. But as we're at the dawn of a new decade, as important as these words are, they're insufficient, aren't they? So the first thing I wanted to reflect on tonight is, wouldn't it be good in the 2020s if that could be a decade marked by truth-telling, by real equality, by long overdue recognition in our constitution, the nation's birth certificate of our first Australians, and by treaty. <laughs> now, a bit like those old Wizard of Id cartoons, I bring you news from the front line, sires. <laughs> I'm pleased to report that Labor has dusted itself off we're standing up, we're behind Anthony Albanese, and we're carrying the fight right up to the government. We're watching the unmasking of the true face of this government, the unravelling of the dismal torpor that is the current national government. But I was very grateful tonight to be invited to talk about May, say a few words. <laughs> And I was actually going to say, because I could tell Chloe and the kids at Christmas as a warm-up act for Paul Kelly. <laughs> but what I didn't appreciate is that whilst I know that the Wheeler Centre and its very informed audiences are the home of proud ideas and important conversations, I didn't realise what a sense of humour they had, because when they sent me the invitation, Dear Bill, you are invited to speak about a month of the year, they then said it was May. <laughs> So, with that sense of humour, it's a bit like being a Collingwood supporter, which I am, asked to review the great grand finals of the 1970s. <laughs> so I thought instead, rather than reviewing the events of May the 18th, <laughs> tonight I thought I would just pick May the 16th and reflect on that. <laughs> or indeed any other day in May, but... But on May the 16th, if you cast your minds back, it was the day that a great Australian heart beat its last. It was on May the 16th that with the passing of Robert James Lee Hawke, our nation mourned and honoured and remembered a great leader. Many of us in the mighty labour movement grieve for a hero, a mentor, a friend. Bob's death saw uh, Australia revisit a cavalcade of hawky stories, both the sublime and the ridiculous. The hard-drinking, hard-living union leader who, when greatness beckoned, put these things away to become a sober leader focused on the good of the nation. In the wild, swinging 70s, Bob was the sun lizard in his speedos poolside, <laughs> lazily bronzing himself at Labor's 1975 conference at Terrigal. <laughs> and while the public knew this Bob, what was less visible were the hours and hours of preparation that he put into making being a formidable advocate look effortless. He knew the minutiae of economics and wages, policies and evidence. It wasn't just the bottle of Latan spray oil <laughs> that was poolside with Bob, it was reams and reams of documents, evidence and argument. And then in the 1980s, Bob was the nation's conscience, weeping after the Tiananmen Square massacre. And then he was the nation's backbone, announcing that all 40,000 Chinese students would be able to stay in Australia. Probably sadly unimaginable today. 
Bob was Father Australia as we won the America's Cup with that iconic declaration of a national sickie to celebrate sporting achievement. <laughs> Bob wrote the nation large. He wrote Australia large with his powerful stance against apartheid right through to his conservation of Antarctica. But for all of the various Bobs, the public and the private Bobs, tonight I want to offer to contribute two final stories, which I think combine all the trays that we mourned on May the 16th. First, there was that self-confidence, consensus-building, deal-making Bob. And that Bob was never on show more than what I call the Frank Sinatra crisis of 1974. <laughs> in 1974, Sinatra was 59. He was staging a comeback. The old blue eyes is back to her. And he lobbed in Melbourne, landed at Essendon for the Australian leg. Now, Frank was cranky coming out of retirement. There was a historical antagonism with the Australian press. He was a bit out of shape. The Jersey boy with mafia links also didn't like the way the world was changing. Feminism was making advances. Just three years earlier, Melbourne-born Helen Reddy's I Am Woman had topped the charts in the United States. But Frank hadn't got the memo. <laughs> At his concert, not too far from here, in the workers' arena at Festival Hall, he'd started venting his spleen about the Australian media. He referred to the broads who were working in the press being hookers, adding with today what we might call a Trumpian flourish. <laughs> I might give them a buck and a half, I'm not sure. Well, the union handling the lighting and the musicians for the tour went on strike until Sinatra apologised. And the Transport Workers Union of Australia said it would not fuel any planes to get old blue eyes to his next gigs in Sydney. <laughs> Somehow Sinatra snuck up there anyway. But now there was a domino effect of union strike action. Working people wanted an apology to the female journalists of Australia. Sinatra replied demanding an apology of his own from the Australian media for, in his words, 15 years of shit. <laughs> the show could not go on. Sinatra could not fly out. It was stalemate. Sinatra was holed up in his Sydney suite drinking. It was like a siege. Two parties with con starkly conflicting interests. No quarter being given on either side. What was needed was a negotiator. And only a world-class master negotiator could break this impasse. The crisis escalated to the top office in the land. The Sinatra Hotel Suite were on the phone line with Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. Gough didn't mince his words. There's only one man who can solve this for you, he said. Bob Hawke. Come off the hour, come off the man. Our Bob swaggered in the President of the Australian Council of Trade Unions with his trademark self-confidence. Sometime later, he staggered out into the... <laughs> talking to the media with a triumphant gleam in his eye, perhaps a little worse for wear. Inside the suite, Bob and Sinatra's hardballed lawyer had horse-traded whilst taking slugs from a bottle of top-shelf cognac. But the inebriation had given birth to compromise. Now, Sinatra was not the type to say sorry, but Bob had emerged with a joint statement of regret <laughs> that acknowledged that everyone had a job to do. The cherry on top was that the show would go on, and one of the Sydney shows would be televised, so people in Melbourne who missed out wouldn't be, miss out too much more. Given the rankled feelings and the high emotions, it was a fair go, fair dinkum, Aussie fashion, bloody good deal in the circumstances, and it was classic hawk. <laughs> the other story that I want to share with you this evening isn't one of those famous war stories of industrial relations. 
It was about a night in Canberra towards the end of 2014. The Whips office had organised a dinner for caucus and staff at the National Press Club and we'd lined up Bob Hawke as a surprise guest of honour. Now Jill Saunders, who was a lovely dedicated woman who managed Bob's diary and organised his life for 36 years, kept us posted throughout the week. Initially, the word was that Bob mightn't be well enough to make it. Then the word was he would be able to attend, but he, he wouldn't be able to speak. Then the word was he was happy to speak, but not for very long, and he, he wanted to leave immediately afterwards. <laughs> anyway, the night arrived, we shuffled the program around so the great man could speak first and then leave straight away. There were around 200 of us, members, senators, Labor staffers. We stood and applauded as this frailer older man, bent by time and toil, shuffled up the stairs and across the stage and placed one single page of notes on the lectern. And then suddenly, a transformation occurred. The shoulders went back, the right hand came up, the index finger extended, <laughs> the imperial eyebrow cocked. <laughs> and in that unmistakable voice, for my generation, the sound of labour history itself. He said, first point, the positive impact of immigration. In the end, our Bob spoke for 75 minutes. <laughs> it was, though, a, a night to remember, a tour de force. Multiculturalism, national security, the role of unions, the future of bargaining, Australia's place in Asia and our duty to protect our environment. And it wasn't an affectionate trip down memory lane. Bob was talking about the future. He was there to educate, to instruct. And my goodness, he was fired up. Every so often he'd sharply begin a sentence with, now Bill, don't forget this. And of course, when he finished his speech, he got us all out of our seats to join him in the customary rendition of Solidarity Forever. When he left the stage, he was mobbed and cheerfully overruling Tanya Plibersek, who'd been under instructions to gently steer him towards the exit. <laughs> he spent the next 20 minutes taking selfies and signing autographs. <laughs> but it should be noted that there were no TV cameras there that night. There were no journalists being treated to an exclusive. There was no one there who Bob needed to charm or persuade. To everyone in that room at the National Press Club, Bob was already a hero, already a legend. We already loved him unconditionally. And through his generosity with his time and his insight and his presence and his undiminished fire, we could tell that he loved us too. For Bob, it was never a performance, it was never an act. His capacity to listen and explain and argue and advocate and generate agreement, it was a skill. A muscle that he trained long ago before he became Prime Minister and one he exercised long after leaving office. That night at the National Press Club, we, everyone could see that he was 81 and a bit tired and not in 100% of health. But everyone could see, we could feel, we could sense that he still wanted to be there, talking the future. He wanted to use all the time he had left to talk about what mattered, the future of his beloved party and the future of his beloved country. He wanted to impart a higher sense of purpose to the people who had the responsibility of carrying his legacy forward. What a remarkable man. When I was in school, Bob Hawke was my hero. He was a big part of why I went into politics and I was lucky, I was so lucky, not just to meet my hero, but to be befriended by my hero. I'll miss him very much. His generous advice, his insight, his sense of the possible. But I'll never forget his example. 
on May the 16th, just as on May the 18th. The light on the hill flickered, it sputtered, but it actually didn't go out. Bob had unfinished business, unfinished business of treaty and climate change. Labor and the nation has unfinished business, unfinished business of treaty and climate change. For Bob bringing together Australians from all walks of life, it was his never finishing work. For Labor and for the nation, it is our never finishing work to constantly strive to bring Australians from all walks of life closer together. Perhaps the last word should be to Blanche. She has a recollection of Bob's last coherent sentence. She was advising him what to do to manage his pain. Blanche told him to surrender to the pain and not to fight it. She writes that like a tiger in the bush, Bob roared back, I can't surrender. He could never stop fighting. He could never surrender. And nor should we. Thank you very much. Bill Shorten, ladies and gentlemen.